Hey everyone, welcome back to Power Electronics. I'm Tim, and this is lecture three. All right, so last time we kind of introduced a lot of topics, and it felt like a lot, it was a lot, but really that was like the most important stuff. And I took a lot of time to explain it because it is absolutely necessary that you understand these ideas if you want to understand how to size or how to analyze switch mode power supplies. So very briefly, we just go over what we discussed. So first, I introduce this idea of steady state operation. And in switch mode power supplies, steady state operation means that cycle to cycle, waveforms look the same, right? So it doesn't mean that they're constant. It just means that if you look at one switching cycle, the next switching cycle should look like that, right? And even point-wise, right, it looks like that. So if you choose some point within a switching cycle of a signal, and then you shift that over by a switching period, it should be equal, right? And I think the way I described it before was that the values at the beginning and end of a, of a period for a signal are the same. And maybe even more, the values at every point in a, in a waveform are the same shifted by switching periods. And this allows us to analyze a single switching period to understand how a power converter works. Cool. The next thing we talked about was small ripple approximation, or SRA. And this is, again, a really important idea, and it enables us to analyze converters without thinking about differential equations, basically. And it doesn't seem like that's what's going on, but really, as we'll show today, it does do that. And the idea with small ripple approximation is that we have some signal, something that varies with time, and we can decompose that into a DC component and an AC component. Right? So the DC component is, is written with the capital letter of the signal we're interested in. So if it's a voltage, it'll be capital V. If it's a current, it'll be capital I. And then the AC component is the lowercase letter with a little tilde, tilde on top. Right, and if the DC, sorry, if the DC comp component is much greater than the AC, or vice versa, if the AC component is much smaller than the than the DC component, then we can, you know, ignore the AC component. That's what small ripple approximation is. We ignore the AC component when it's really small relative to the DC component, and we'll be using that today to like to understand the waveforms in a switch mode power supply. Cool. Okay, then the next one is IVSB. This is the next thing we talked about. And again, all it's saying, super important tool. It allows you to find DC voltages in a switch mode power supply. And the observation was that if we're operating in steady state, then the average voltage applied to an inductor, right? The average voltage applied to an inductor over one switching cycle, right? If you go over a complete switching cycle, that average voltage should be zero. And similar with capacitive charge balance. So if we're operating in steady state, then the average current injected into a capacitor over one switching cycle is zero. And using these two tools, we can find the average voltages and currents in a switch mode power supply, which is, you know, kind of what we're trying to do. Cool. So last time we were looking at a buck converter. Right, so the buck converter has two switching states, right? One between zero and DTS, DTSW, and the other between DTSW and TSW, right? So in, in this one, Q1 is on and Q2 is off. And here, Q1 is off and Q2 is on. Cool. And what we were given, so I have V bad here, ignore bad. It's, we're thinking VG. So yeah, just think VG. So what we were given was, were these DC values, right? So we had the input voltage, VG is 12 volts. We had the output voltage that we wanted, right? We're trying to force this to happen. We want five volts. You can always think about it like the, the switch one power supply, we have some inputs and we want to, to get a specific output. In this case, five volts. We want five volts and we accomplish this by pulse width modulation. Right, we vary D 
we varied the duty ratio to control the output voltage. So really this, this problem was what D do we need to get the specific output voltage of five volts? And finally, we also had the output current, how much current is drawn is being consumed by the load. In this case, we're considering resistive loads, right? So our load is usually is how we've drawn it. But it's not that hard to think about the fact that we're, we're specifying a current, right? Because the current is just the output voltage divided by the load resistance. Cool. And let's let's just, you know, quickly go over what we did. So we we thought about the voltage applied to the inductor in each switching state, right? We went through those steps, voltage applied to the inductor, VL. And then we also thought about, or we, we looked at the current flowing through the capacitor, right? To apply CCB. And what we found was in the first switching state, VL was VG minus V out. And here I've applied SRA, right? I've assumed that the output voltage is constant. The ripple of the output voltage is small relative to the DC value. And in the second state, again, the output voltage or the capacitor, sorry, the inductor voltage is simply minus V out. The voltage applied to the inductor is minus V out. And again, I've applied SRA. And then the, uh, the capacitor current, IC. In the first state, we found that it was equal to, if this is IL, it was equal to IL minus V out over R. And in the second state, again, it was equal to IL of T minus V out over R. I just want to remind you that here I applied SRA to the output voltage. in both cases, but I did not apply SRA to the inductor current. And that's usually what we do. And here you can kind of see why. So that we, we have these new specifications, right? We've been given these new specifications because now what we want to do, now we want to find L and C. We want to know what the inductance and capacitance is. So actually, just, just continuing on, we applied IVSB, and we found that the conversion ratio, the output voltage to the input voltage, which is M of D, is equal to D. So in other words, V out, we found an expression for V out. V out is equal to D times VG. And we also found, using CCB, we found that the average inductor current, IL, is equal to V out over R load, right? And th this isn't, uh, I'm not saying that you can apply uh, SRA to IL, it's just that here, this is the DC component of IL. There is still, we still have to find what the AC component is. All CCB told us was the DC component. So using IVSB and CCB, we, we have a DC solution, but now we have these extra constraints, right? These extra specifications in the converter. We have the switching frequency and we have these components, right? So what are these things? These are ripple constraints. And this is kind of where small ripple approximation, you know, we, we can kind of like see it practically, right? So for the inductor current, so what we're saying, delta IL is the difference between the average and peak inductor currents peak inductor current. And similarly, delta V out average and peak capacitor voltage, right? 
So what we're saying here is that we we want we want to design the converter such that the difference between the average inductor current and the peak inductor current is 10%. 10% of what? 10% of the average inductor current. All right, so in this case, the average inductor current, IL, is V out over R load, which in this case is 10 amps. All right, we're saying it's 10 amps. So that means that delta IL, the delta IL we want, the difference between the average and the peak inductor current is equal to one amp, right? So we kind of have to do this conversion. Sometimes it's specified in percentages. So we want, we want the maximum difference between the average inductor current and the peak inductor current to be one amp. Similarly, the average, the average inductor current and the minimum inductor current, one amp. And we also want the difference between the average output voltage and the maximum output voltage to be 1%. 1% of what? 1% of what? 1% of the average output voltage. So in this case, we know that V out is 5 volts, which means delta V out, we want delta V out to be 1% of 5 volts or 50 millivolts. So th this is saying that, in other words, IL max is 11 amps and V out max is 5.05 volts, right? So how is this related to SRA? How is this related to small ripple approximation? Well, think about it, right? One amp away from 10 amps is, is pretty big, right? I mean, relatively big, let's say. It's, it's a big difference. It's not small. However, 50 millivolts away from five volts is tiny. Like you, some maybe some applications you might notice it, but for the most part, that is really really small, right? So this isn't really this 50 millivolts isn't really significant relative to the DC, but one amp actually kind of is pretty significant to the DC. So. If this is what we're getting at the output, maybe it's okay to ignore the 50 millivolts, but in this case, it really isn't okay to ignore that, that one amp. And we'll see it even in even more detail in the next section. So again, what we're trying to do now, we found the DC solution, now we want to know what L and C are. And to do that, we need to draw out the waveforms of these converters, right? The waveforms of these currents and voltages. So how are we gonna do that? Well. We do that in the following way. And I'm just gonna give you the way the, the solution to do it or the, the path we're going to take. So first what we're going to do, we're gonna draw out the inductor voltage. Right? The inductor voltage is actually the derivative of the inductor current. Why do we want the derivative of the inductor current? Because we want to know how the inductor current varies over time. So we've already assumed that the inductor voltage or the voltages applied to the inductor are DC, right? So it's constant. It's constant or piecewise constant, right? So that's kind of easy to figure out. However, the inductor current isn't going to be piecewise constant. Furthermore, the inductor current, the capacitor current actually depends on the inductor current. So before we get the, pass the capacitor current, we have to get the inductor current. And we get the inductor current from the inductor voltage. So we're kind of like working backwards. In the end, what we want to find are the waveforms for the inductor current and the waveforms for the capacitor voltage. And from that, we can figure out what the ripples are. So first we start with the inductor current. Once we plot out the inductor current, we have some information of the, or, sorry, first we want the inductor voltage. Once we plot out the inductor voltage, we'll have some information about the inductor current, right? So then we can draw the inductor current. Once we have the inductor current, then we have information about the capacitor current, right? Then we found something out about the capacitor current. So then we can draw the capacitor current. And I'll use, I'll actually use a different color here. 
So after we get the, the inductor current, then we can find the capacitor current. And the capacitor current is actually you know, the derivative of the capacitor voltage. So now we have information on the change of the capacitor voltage over time, which means we can then draw the capacitor voltage, right? So that's the path we have to take. And just to clarify why we're using small ripple approximation again, think about if we didn't use small ripple approximation, right? That would mean that the inductor voltage would be a function of the capacitor voltage, right? So in order to find the inductor voltage, we would have to know the capacitor voltage. But to know the capacitor voltage, we need the capacitor current. To know the capacitor current, we need the inductor current, right? And to know the inductor current, we need the inductor voltage. So we have this like circular dependence happening, right? So without SRA, we have some circular dependence between uh, cap voltage to inductor voltage to inductor current to cap current, right? Which then leads back to our cap voltage. So there's this circular thing going on, right? Like, where do you start? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll make that arrow a little bit better. So with this circular dependence, it's like, where do you start? What do you have to know first? You have to know something first before you can start, but you know, at what point do you start? Well, the cool thing is, is that small ripple approximation breaks this, this dependence. Small Using small ripple approximation breaks this loop and it breaks it right here. So if we use SRA, we break this dependence and we're able to solve this converter without doing differential equations. And that's really the goal. We, we, really, we really do not want to do differential equations. We'd much rather just draw pictures and solve you know, basic algebra. And that's what we're doing. Small ripple approximation allows us to do that. Cool. So let's do it. Let's, let's take this path. And this is kind of a general path. Usually we start with inductor voltages, then inductor currents, then cap voltages and cap currents. That's typically how it goes. There'll be some specific examples where it might not work like that, but for the most part, this is the path you should take. Inductor voltage, inductor current. Cap current, cap voltage. Because usually small ripple approximation is applied to cap voltages, which will result in inductor voltages being DC. Great. So to draw out these waveforms, again, we're assuming we're operating in steady state, which means we only need to draw a single switching cycle, right? These are all a function of T. We have one switching cycle. I'm gonna draw this one switching cycle for both, for all four of these waveforms. Cool. Within each switching cycle, there are two sub intervals, right? So the first one between zero and DTSW, and the second one between DTSW and TSW, right? Here. And I'll draw it over here, DTSW, great. So, inductor voltage. In the first sub-interval, the inductor voltage is Vg minus V out, right? We got that from the equation we wrote before. Great. In the second sub-interval, the inductor voltage is equal to minus V out. And then we repeat, right? Then it goes back up. So here it's minus V out. And here you can see inductor volt second balance happening, right? So in this first sub-interval, we're applying positive volt seconds. And then to be operating in steady state, then this negative portion must be equal, this area must be equal to this area, right? So that is the balance we're talking about in inductor volt second balance. Great, okay, now we're gonna draw the inductor current, right? The inductor voltage was easy, now the inductor current. So we already have some information about the inductor current. We know what the average value is, right? The average value of the inductor current is V out over our load, or in this case, 10 amps. So we can just, you know, put that in. We know that the average is 10 amps, somewhere here. Okay, and we also know something about the derivative of the inductor current, right? Maybe more specifically, what we know is the slope of the inductor current. We know that 
dil by dt is equal to v of t over l. Perfect. So in the first subinterval, we know the slope of the inductor current is vg minus v over l. Right? Because it's constant. So the integral of a constant is a linear function. And we know that in this first subinterval, we're going from the minimum current to the maximum current. The, the only time the inductor gets charged is in this interval, right? So if the inductor current is going up, it's starting from the bottom and going to the top. And then the second subinterval, it's starting from the top and discharging as much as it possibly will, right? So in this first subinterval, we're starting from the minimum and going to the maximum. And in the second, we're, we're starting from the maximum and going to the minimum. So it turns out that this is going to be equal, right? It's going to be equally distributed from top to bottom. Why is that? Well, imagine that the line was not equal, or the maximum and minimum were not equally distributed around this average. What would that mean? Well, it would mean that the, like, the average of that line is actually greater than the average we specified here, right? So because this is the average, these lines must bisect this average in the middle, right? So we have I min and we have I max and we have a slope. So maybe I'll draw the slope a little bit better. It is for sure a straight line or due to small ripple approximation, we can approximate it as a line. Great. And in the second sub interval, it goes from the max to the min with a different slope, right? So the first slope, right, is VL over L or VG minus V out over L. VG minus V out over L. In the second sub interval, it's just minus, the slope is minus V out over L. Awesome. So from small ripple approximation, we were able to construct an inductor current that is piecewise linear, right? And then it repeats. So it's kind of like a triangle wave, right? It's a triangle wave with an average of 10 amps for this particular example. Awesome. So now we have the inductor current. Next step is the capacitor current. So going back to this, the capacitor current is simply the inductor current minus the average inductor current, right? V out over R load is the average inductor current. And that happens in both cycles. So in both cycles, the capacitor current is the inductor current minus its average. Well, what is the inductor current minus its average? It's just this waveform shifted down by 10 amps. So centering this triangle at 10 amps, right? So we can, for the buck, we can literally just copy the inductor current, but center it, center it at zero, right? So it goes up and then goes back down. So the capacitor current looks like a triangle centered at zero, a triangle wave centered at zero with, with two different slopes. Great. So now we have the capacitor current. And now we have to find the capacitor voltage. Well, again, we have some information about the capacitor voltage. We know what the average is. The average is five volts. So we can put that in. And we know that this AC current applied to the capacitor is going to cause some ripple on the capacitor, right? We're, we're injecting some charge or we're injecting some charge here and we're taking out some charge here, right? There's some positive current going into the cap at this point, and there's some negative current being put into the cap or current being drawn out of the cap when the current is below zero. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit more complicated, right? Because this is already linear, so the integral of a linear equation must be a quadratic equation. But we don't really want to solve integrals directly. I mean, you can if you want. I encourage you to do that. So instead, what I'm going to do is kind of a a hand wavy way of, of, of drawing out this, this waveform. So what do we know about derivatives? When derivatives are zero, it means the slope of the waveform is zero, right? So we have these zero crossings of the current, which means at these points, the voltage must have zero slope. So maybe it's here, maybe it's here, who knows, but it's for sure zero, right? It's gonna be flat. In this portion, right, where the, in the very beginning, so this is DTSW, this is TSW. In this very first portion, before this first zero crossing, we're 
taking charge out of the capacitor. That means that the capacitor voltage is decreasing. If the capacitor voltage is decreasing, then it can't hit a maximum after it's decreasing. It must hit a minimum, right? So it must be going down, right? It must be going, it must be, it must start below the average. It must start the switching cycle below the average here in order to reach a minimum, right? It couldn't be flat here because it would be in the next portion we're actually increasing, right? So in this very first portion before the first zero crossing, our slope is negative and it's below the average. Then we hit the zero crossing, the slope is zero, and then we start increasing the voltage, right? Because we're injecting charge. This is positive charge being put into the capacitor. So the slope is increasing here, right? And kind of makes sense too, right? Because we're going to reach a maximum somewhere over here. So the slope is increasing. And then finally back again over here, we're taking, there's negative current going into the cap. So we're decreasing. And we go and we match back up with here. So connecting all these lines together, we start at the average, we decrease towards a, towards a minimum, we reach the minimum, start charging the capacitor, and eventually reach a maximum at the next zero crossing, and then start decreasing again. And these things are, this is like a quadratic waveform. It's like two quadratics glued together. But we don't really care about the exact waveform because this is really just a drawing. This is a tool to help us find what the ripple is. It's, it's to help us find an expression for the ripple, right? So the, the difference, right, delta V out, the difference between the average, which is here, and the maximum, which is here, right? So this is what we're looking for, delta V out. And we're also looking for the same for the current, right? This is the difference between the average and the maximum, delta I L. Awesome. So that's what we're, those are the two things we're looking for. Okay, one more note. We also want to inspect these a little bit further. So we have a constant slope in this inductor current. It starts at the minimum. Again, just, just so you're aware, average to the minimum is also equal. This is also delta IL, right? Because this is the middle of this triangle wave, right? So it must go up as much as it goes down. Otherwise, the average wouldn't be in the middle, right? Cool. So we're starting at a minimum. We're going to a maximum with a constant slope. That means that we intersect the average exactly halfway between 0 and DTSW, right? This is half DTSW. And I'll let you figure that out for yourselves, but it is true. And similarly on the second side, right, between DTSW and TSW, the current intersects the average halfway, right? So I'm just going to say this is half D prime TSW. And I'll put that in quotes, right? Because it's not the absolute time on here. It's like DTSW plus half prime D prime TSW. But in quotes, it's this, right? This half D prime TSW. And that's also true over here, right? Because we've just copied the inductor current for the capacitor current, but shifted it down. So these, these zero crossings occur at the same place, right? It occurs at half DTSW and in quotes, half D prime TSW. Right, so we've kind of like drawn all the important points of these waveforms, right? The zero crossings, the maximums, the minimums, the slopes. That's that's all the information we need. So now we can figure out what the inductor what inductance we need to ensure this inductor current ripple and what capacitance we need to ensure this capacitor voltage ripple. So let's do that. So now we want to find we want to find L. We want to find L to ensure delta IL is equal to 10% of IL, right? This, this is our goal. This is what we want to do. So how do we do that? How do we relate L to delta IL? Well, look at this waveform, right? We can look directly at this waveform. So we have some slope and we have some delta IL, right? There's a, there's a relation right here. This is like a triangle. This is a little triangle right here. 
So using this triangle, we can find what, del what L should be for a specific delta I. L. Let's just redraw it here very quickly. And I'll even use the nice colors. So we have a triangle. This is del the delta I L we're looking for. We have a slope. BG minus B out over L. And this is DTSW. And to the minimum, again, it's delta IL. Great. So looking at this slope, what we, what we can think is slope equals rise over run. Right? Back to grade school. The slope is the difference in y over the difference in x. That's the slope of a line. So what's the difference in y? The difference in y is, well, we're starting from the minimum, right? We're starting from here and we're going to the maximum. The difference between the minimum and maximum is two delta IL, right? So the rise is two delta IL. And what's the run? The run is the difference in the x value, or in this case, time. We're starting from zero and we're going up to DTSW. So the, the run is DTSW. And what's the slope? The slope is VG minus V out over L. So simply by looking at this waveform, we found a relation between L and delta IL. Perfect. This is exactly what we want. So if we solve for L, this is what we get. L equals, so we just kind of have to flip this around, right? Equals VG minus V out times DTSW over 2 delta IL. And we can solve this, right? We can solve this directly for this specific uh, example, right? Because we know I out. We know we want delta IL to be 10%, which is 1 amp, right? So this is 1 amp. This thing is equal to TSW is equal to 1 over FSW. And FSW is 100 kilohertz. We know what D is, right? D is simply V out over VG, right? Right, because that's what M of D is. And we know what the input voltage is and we know what the output voltage is. So we can just solve for what L is, right? Directly, L, let's write it in, is equal to 12 minus five times five over 12, times one over 100K over two times one. And if you solve this, it turns out L is equal to, well, I got 14.6 microhenries, and I hope that is actually correct. And if it is not, please check for yourselves. But this is what I got for L, and uh, yeah, that that's exactly how you do it. You look at the slopes, you figure out what the rise over the run is, and you can calculate L for the buck converter. Again, you can look this up, but think about how simple it is to find it, right? You just have to draw the waveforms and then kind of just pops out. Super easy. Great. So now let's look at the capacitor voltage. So we found L, now we want to find C such that delta V out, which is delta VC, right? They're the same, they're the same voltage is equal to 1% of the out. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to choose C such that the ripple is 1% of the output voltage. Great, okay, so this is a little bit more challenging, right? If you think about the ripple of the capacitor or the waveform of the capacitor, we can't do the slope trick anymore, right? Because now, the capacitor voltage looks like a quadratic and we don't want to integrate quadratics like that's already too difficult. So we want to do something a little bit different. So what I want to recall is a very simple equation. We've talked about it before. Delta VC, the change in capacitor voltage is equal to the change in Q, the change in charge applied to the cap over C. Right, so if you want to change a capacitor's voltage, you apply some charge to it. So what is Q? So this is this is what we want, or th th this is a variation in the capacitor voltage that we want. 
this is what we're looking for. So what's Q? What is Q? Well, Q, Q is the integral of I, right? You just integrate I. And that's what that's what charge is. Charge is just the integral of current. So we know what current is, right? The current is this waveform. So the integral of this waveform is somehow the charge we're looking for. So look at this waveform. Going from the minimum to the maximum, to make this change in voltage, we have to apply some positive Q, right? We're increasing the capacitor voltage, so we have to be injecting charge into that cap. What is that charge we're injecting? It's this thing. It's the area under this curve. This is the delta, delta Q. And I'll call it delta Q positive, right? That's delta Q positive, And then this stuff, that's delta Q negative. And that brings the cap voltage from its maximum to its minimum. We can look at either one. Let's look at this one, right? All we're looking at is this triangle. We have to find the area of this triangle to find delta Q positive. So delta Q positive, the thing we're looking for, the thing that takes the capacitor voltage from its minimum to its maximum is the area under a triangle. Okay, so the difference between the minimum and maximum is two delta V out, right? Because looking back at this waveform, right? We're one delta below the average, and then we go up to one delta above the average. So two delta V out is equal to delta Q positive over C. And this is, this is what we're trying to solve for. So what's delta Q positive? It's half the base times height. Base times height, right? What is the base? What is the height? That is what we're going to find out. So the height is pretty simple. This waveform is this waveform shifted down. The height of this waveform is delta IL. So this height is delta IL. What's the base? Well, think about what we were saying before with half delta IL or half DTS, right? So we have half DTS here and we have half D prime TS here. So the height is delta IL. The base equals half DTS plus half D prime TS, which is half TS. Awesome, so we, we basically had the solution. Two delta V out is equal to half the base, half switching period times the height delta IL over C. Or C is equal to, if we just rearrange this, C is equal to delta IL over eight delta V out times FSW. So you could sub in the equation for delta IL here, but we know what we want delta IL to be, right? So we have that we have this equation for delta IL that we could use, right? And we could see that the C is actually related in some way to the L. However, we know what delta IL should be. Delta IL should be 10% of the average or one amp. So we can just solve this directly, right? Let's use a different color. So Actually, we should use this, this orange color. So this is one amp. This thing is 1% of five volts, which is 50 millivolts. And this is 100K. So pl putting that in, we get C is equal to one amp over eight, 50 millivolts, 100K. And if I did my math correctly, it is entirely possible that I did not. It's 250, not K, microfarads, which is pretty large, but not so unexpected. Maybe it's 25, but I believe it's 250.
I'll leave that to you to check out. Cool. Okay, so that, that's pretty easy, right? For the buck, all we have to do is look at the slope of the inductor current to find what L should be, and look at the area under this triangle to find what C should be. Super easy. So let's just, let's just you know, take stock of what's going on. So the inductor current, let's, I believe I used this. So the inductor, the inductor current, L is equal to VG minus V out DTSW over two delta IL, right? That's L, that's how you solve for L. And then for C, it's equal to delta IL over eight delta V out FSW, right? So you could also put this, the switching frequency on the bottom. Why don't I do that? So let's let's notice some things. Let's let's uh, take note of what's going on. So first of all, higher FSW, smaller components, or in other words, lower FSW, bigger components, larger ripple. Smaller components, right? If the ripple, if we allow larger ripple, then we can make things smaller. Smaller ripple, if we want to constrain the ripple more, we need bigger components to do that. So this is this is kind of trade. There's this trade-off, right? If we want things to be, if we want ripples to be small, then we need components to be large, or we need to switch really quickly. And we can kind of play around with this stuff. So there's like a lot of optimization people do to figure out what the best size for things should be you know they can vary the switching frequency vary the required ripple sometimes ripples is like too is like constrained by some outside source so we need to like choose like the switching frequency and there's also losses involved anyways this is generally what you should be thinking about right so just in general if you switch faster you get smaller components if you switch slower then you get bigger components over constraints large components, under constrained, small components. That's typically how it goes. Cool. Okay, so that kind of answers the question for like a fixed, a fixed problem, right? One output voltage, one input voltage, one current. But what happens, sorry, what happens when the current and voltage vary, the input voltage vary. What happens then? Right, we have to be a bit more careful, right? So let's just write out the inductor, the equation for the inductor current ripple again, just to remind ourselves. So L is equal to um, VG minus V out times D over delta IL FSW, sorry, two delta IL FSW. Right, slope, slope times time, ripple, etc. Okay, cool. So notice, notice that this is actually a function of VG, right? And even more so, D is a function of VG, right? D, if you recall, D is actually equal to V out over VG. So let's put that in. Let's put that in just so that this is a function of a single variable. So we can kind of imagine L is a function of VG in this case, right? VG is varying. It's also a function of IL. And we'll see how that, that varies based on the different specifications. Or I out. In this case, I L is I out. Anyways, I'll replace D with V out over VG. Cool. So now this is only, there's no D anymore. We've eliminated D because we've noted it's a function of VG. And now let's look at two different cases. So the first case, what happens if say we have a constraint where the inductor current can never be negative? It always has to be greater than zero. You'll see that this is actually kind of a reasonable constraint for, for some situations, but uh, let's just say this is this is what we're trying to do. So, so what is this saying? It's saying that 
our maximum ripple, or whatever ripple we choose, must be smaller than the lowest average current. So why is that the case? Think about what happens at our minimum current. At our minimum current, we're as close to we're as close to zero as possible. There's going to be some ripple on on this current, right? It goes up, it goes down. The largest this ripple can be, right? The difference between the average and the minimum is equal to the average. It equals IL, right? If the ripple was larger at this minimum current, then the ripple would actually go below zero. So what this is saying, delta IL must be greater than zero. What it's saying is that the ripple must be less than IL min. In this case, let's just say less than or equal to. We're not going to be so hard on ourselves if we actually hit zero. It's if we go if we go below zero, then it's kind of bad. So what this is actually saying, delta IL of T must be greater than zero at all times. It's saying that the ripple must be smaller than the minimum current. In this case, let's just say one amp. So delta IL must be less than, sorry, must be less than or equal to one amp. And because we don't want to make our inductors larger than they actually are, we'll just say it's equal to one amp, right? So the, the delta IL is equal to one amp. Okay, so we've kind of figured out this I question, this IL question for this first problem. But now VG, so we have L is equal to, and I'll just distribute this term in, into this other term, right? So multiplying V out over VG by VG is just V out. And multiplying V out by V out over VG is V out squared over VG. And now we know what the ripple can be, right? The ripple must be one amp. And we know the switching frequency is it's 100 kilohertz. Okay, so what's going on with this with this equation? How, what VG do we pick, right? Or what L do we pick so that for all cases, for all case, for all choices of VG, whichever VG you choose, Delta IL will never be greater than one greater than one amp. What what do you choose? Well, we want to choose the biggest inductance, basically, right? Because if you choose a smaller inductance than what any of these specify, then if you choose a different VG, then maybe that ripple will be bigger. So we have, we basically have to choose the maximum inductance. We have to find the maximum of this function. Right, if you choose anything less than the maximum of this function, then even though you've put you've put one amp here for some specific G, VG, there there will be another VG which causes that ripple to be larger. So we have to find this mac the maximum of this function with respect to VG. Okay. So how do we do that? Well we take the derivative with respect to VG. And I'll just lump this as a constant, right? It's actually 200K, but I'll, I'll just lump it as a constant out here. And we're taking the derivative of this thing. So the derivative of V out with respect to VG is zero. V out is a constant. The derivative of V out squared over VG minus V out squared over VG is simply equal to V out squared over VG squared. And you can do that yourselves if you want to, but Taking the derivative of an inverse, there's a minus sign, right? So from squared, get rid of the minus sign. This is what we get. So what is this saying? This is saying that L as a function of VG is increasing, right? So actually at one point, right, if VG is equal to V out, this is actually zero. And beyond that, it's increasing. So it's increasing. We want to find the maximum. The maximum, if it's just always increasing, the maximum occurs at our maximum voltage, right? Our maximum input, input voltage. So the worst case is the maximum VG. So 
right? So it turns out in this case, if you if you just solve this, right? If you solve this, uh, solve this equation, you plug in one amp, right? Well, we already had one amp from before, and we already solved it for 12 volts. So that that, that just means that L must be 14.6 microhenries. That's what we get. So, but we had to we had to kind of be really careful, right? First, we had to figure out what the ripple constraint was, right, from this just absolute constraint on the inductor current. And then we also had to figure out what the worst case input voltage was. And it turned out, just by taking the derivative with respect to the input voltage, that worst case occurred at the maximum input voltage. And plugging that all in gives us this. Okay, we have another problem, right? It's a different problem. And it's different, but it's also kind of the same, right? So in this case, what we're saying is that the peak to peak, so this P to P means peak to peak, the delta ILP peak to peak must be less than 250 milliamps. It's not related to IL, it's just saying no matter what, the ripple must be less than 250 milliamps. And you can imagine this peak to peak is actually just twice the ripple, right? So this is this is what this is saying is delta IL must be less than 125 milliamps. Okay, so we just have an absolute function with respect to delta I, or we just, it's just a number, right? Delta IL is just a number. So we can just plug that into this equation. And again, we still have to be careful, right? Under all cases of VG, this must, this must hold. We must always be less than 125 milliamps. So again, we do the same thing. We find that the, the derivative of L with respect to VG is this increasing function with respect to VG. Or the slope is positive, right? The slope is positive everywhere. So that means that the worst case, the worst case occurs at max VG, again for this. In other situations, and this might not be the case, but for this particular case, this is when it occurs. It occurs at maximum VG. So if we plug that all in, we get L is equal to 12 minus 5 times 5 over 12 times 2 times 125 milliamps times 100k. So if you notice, this is actually um, four times smaller, or sorry, four times larger. This L should be four times larger than this L, right? Because we've just increased our constraint by four times, sorry, eight times, eight times. We've just increased our constraint by eight times, right? So I'll call this L prime. L prime is just equal to eight times L because since, right, since this delta IL prime is equal to, sorry, the other way. Delta IL prime is equal to delta IL over eight, this previous delta IL. So I'll call this delta IL prime. Delta IL prime is equal to this delta IL over eight, it is one eighth. So the ripple is one eighth of this ripple, meaning that the L has to be eight times larger to achieve that. And again, it's for the same, it's for the same case of VG equals 12 volts. Cool, so again, this is just to highlight that it's, if things are changing, if voltages and currents are changing, it's not so straightforward necessarily to choose L. You can't just plug in, you can't just choose a VG randomly, you can't just choose an I out randomly. You have to be careful which one you choose. And we'll do more examples of this in the future. All right. Okay, so next time, next time, that, that was it for today. Again, it was more technical, right? And we we're kind of going through more problems or we're going through problems more deeply. And again, that's something I want to continue doing. But uh, for now, that's it. I hope you understood it. Again, rewatch it if you want to. Go over it again. Slow down, write notes. Do what you need to do. Next lecture, we're going to be going over semiconductor devices, right? Different choices of switches. So right now we've kind of been choosing ideal switches. We've been looking at ideal switches, right? Just like a stick that goes between open and closed. However, we actually when we actually implement these things, we actually have to choose devices that will work for the specific applications. So we're going to go over a description of a br relatively broad description of different semiconductor devices used in power electronics.
and they're different from conventional, you know, analog electronics or whatever. There are some specific choices that need to be made in order to make these things work. And then I'm also going to propose how we choose switches for converters. So we've figured out DC solutions, right, for voltages and currents. We figured out how to choose L and C. And now we're figuring out how to choose the switches, how to choose the semiconductors for our converter. So we're getting closer to actually being able to build a converter. Great. That's it for now. I hope you had a good time and I'll see you later.